And I, I think on a deeper level, uh, they, the alternative right questions the real fundamental egalitarian and democratic assumptions of both the left and the right, both the Democrats and the Republicans in the United States. Um, Alain de Benoit, uh, who's a, um, uh, a member of the, the so-called you know, Nouvelle Droite, uh, the New Right in, in France, he, he once uh, addressed the French Communist Party and he said that really left and right are no longer operative. What's operative is the center and the, the outliers. The center being egalitarianism, being democracy, being mass consumerism, so on globalism, so on and so forth, uh, and people kind of being on the outside. Uh, another one of my uh, friends and, and someone who's contributed to, uh, to the website, Jim Kalb, uh, he said, you know, what, what the alternative right is, is really, it's thinking the unthinkable, thinking something that's dangerous. And uh, uh, I, I think that's a, a very good definition. Uh, also, I would, uh, there's another thing that I'll stress, and I'm going to return to this a little bit later in the talk, but there's a whole blogosphere that's developed around uh, Steve Saylor. And, uh, and basically something that I think now is being called HBD, which is human biodiversity. It, it, it was formerly called uh, sociobiology. And it also is related to what might be called race realism. Um, and in some ways related to white nationalism, if you think of uh, Jira Taylor and people like that. But there's a whole blogosphere focused around HBD. Uh, and this is, again, something that is um, without question taboo uh, in the mainstream. Uh, of both left and right, and I, I think it's something that uh, uh, that, it, that is certainly a kind of you know engine driving the alternative right, and something that, that separates us from uh, from pretty much everyone else. I want to focus on a, a few things that really separate the alternative right uh, and why we're different, and and why uh, we are kind of questioning uh, these uh, these values of the conservative movement in a very fundamental way. Um, and I'm going to talk about this in, in terms of HBD, human biodiversity. Um, you know, our, uh, the information age has certainly become an age of public outrage. Uh, you have every, certainly every week, there's some various race or, or gender scandal that goes on. If you, uh, you know, the, perhaps the Duke lacrosse case would be a, one that ha you know, happened a couple of years ago that's pretty evident. And usually the right wing in America can be relied upon to criticize these things. Um, uh, you, know, you, th you can usually rely upon them to kind of point out the obvious and say that, um, you know, uh, no, Al Sharpton's a bad guy, he's ridiculous. Uh, you shouldn't just indulge in white guilt and say that uh, it's really slavery that keeps everyone down and that's why we have income or educational gaps. And that no, you know, a new uh, social program is actually not going to help black people. Uh, it, it might act very well, these new welfare programs are very well hurt them, and so on and so forth. They, they can usually be relied to, to point out the obvious. Uh, but what's important here is that the right always criticizes the left's race obsessions um, with the, within the context of its own lysenkoism and version of multicultural togetherness. Uh, and if you put it another way, the right criticizes the left only within the horizon of egalitarianism. And therefore, what you really need for, say, African Americans, if they're not you know, achieving to the level of whites or Asians, is not a new welfare program because that won't work. But instead, you need a kind of values therapy uh, on them. You, they need to be taught about family values and constitutionalism, and, and soon they'll kind of rise up to the top. So basically, what the conservative movement has is its own egalitarian uh, multicultural uh, image of basically this kind of uh, society of interchangeable individuals that are basically classless and ethnicity and raceless. And, in, you know, this is, and, and again, this goes back to this point of conser the American conservatism as basically a kind of version of the left. Uh, they have their own rights of man and they, they, have, they have all this kind of stuff. Um, I think basically what is very important, one an important way to fight against this, and to fight against this on the most fundamental level, is a, a rational and a realistic understanding of, of race differences. Um, and certainly Richard Len will be speaking on this, so I, I don't think I need to, uh, to go into this much further. Um, there, there's obvious uh, overwhelming amount of evidence 
of, uh, of IQ differences between uh, 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 you know, Africans, uh, African Americans in America having usually an IQ of 85, um, Latinos, Hispanics, somewhere in the 90 range, uh, of white Americans as a kind of mean 100, usually Asians a little bit above that and Jews a little bit above that. Um, there's an overwhelming amount of evidence that this exists. Um, there's also an overwhelming amount of genetic evidence uh, that this is this. Now, I don't say any of this. I don't think understanding, say, IQ differences is going to, uh, is, is going to be very good at um, white consciousness raising or thinking, things like that. I think that is something that's the, uh, the domain of poetry and, uh, and, and literature and, uh, and philosophy, uh, maybe. I do think um, that having an understanding of this is essential um, as a, as a counterattack uh, against this ever encroaching welfare state and the ever uh, you know, expanding egalitarian um, ideology. Uh, I, I won't go in this because I, I, I don't want uh, to go over, uh, but certainly Marx uh, uh, in his uh, Gotha program uh, basically set out uh, very explicitly that equal rights are, are th these are basically bourgeois rights and they are, they are unequal rights in the sense that there is a natural aristocracy of talent, uh, there is a natural aristocracy of ability, um, and that basically there, th this, these equal or bourgeois rights are going to lead to unequal income, uh, unequal outcomes uh, and, and incomes. And, uh, and in a sense, what he wanted in a communist society is that we would move beyond mere uh, bourgeois equal rights and we'd, we'd uh, you know, soon fly the banner of from each according to his capacity to each according to his need. In some ways, Marx should be praised for his honesty uh, in the sense that he, he was, he, you know, when you, the typical leftist now, whenever you talk about, say, race differences or IQ, they think you're delusional or you're hateful or you're, you're, you're somehow crazy and should be locked up. Marx actually very much acknowledged the natural aristocracy of talent and ability, and he claimed that it, should, it must be crushed. Um, and, uh, you know, when you think about Murray Rothbard, was certainly well uh, aware of this fact and the, the, the importance of, uh, of understanding race differences. If you, if you look at his, uh, his praise of, say, uh, Charles Murray and, and Richard Hernstein's The Bell Curve, he asked the question of why we talk about race. Uh, and he said, if and when we as populists and libertarians abolish the welfare state in all its aspect, and property rights in the free markets are, are triumphant, many individuals and groups will predictably, predictably not like uh, uh, the end result. Uh, and that is the case, you know, certainly a great deal of the, uh, there might not be a black middle class, certainly, without the, the welfare state and, and federal employment. Uh, there, there are many people who benefit from that. And uh, in, in this case, uh, those ethnic and other groups who might um, be concentrated in lower income or less prestigious occupations, guided by their socialist mentors, will predictably raise the cry that the free market, ca the free market is evil and discriminatory and that therefore collectivism is needed to redress the balance. In that case, the intelligence argument will become useful to defend the market economy and free society from ignorant or self-serving attacks. In short, racialist science is properly not an act of aggression um, or a cover for oppression of one group of, or another, but to the contrary, an operation in defense of private property and against assaults by aggressors. Uh, and I would just add, uh, in closing of this, uh, of this section, um, that I, I would really say that the left liberal establishment, for them, race is of paramount importance. They, they think about it, they, they might not think about anything else. It, it's kind of interesting, the, um, there's a former Tony Blair speechwriter, and uh, he admitted that uh, their immigration policy in the late 90s and early 2000s was 100% about race. It had nothing to do with the economy. They actually hoped that the economy wouldn't, was big enough to kind of absorb all these third world undesirables that were brought into the country. Uh, and, uh, and basically he wanted to, in his words, rub the right's face in diversity, to kind of build up so much diversity that they couldn't possibly get rid of it after about 10 years. So basically the left is always thinking about race. Uh, many right-wing people don't want to think about it because it's mean and nasty or it might mean you're a Nazi or something like that. Um, and so you, you know, the right might not want to think about race, but race is thinking about them. 
Uh, and you really can't choose where you fight battles. If you're being attacked by sea, you have to fight by sea. When you're being attacked by sea, you can't decide you're going to raise an army on land. And if you're being attacked on the racial question, you need to, uh, to do a counterattack in the most fundamental aspect of that. Um, and, and not, you know, as I, as I mentioned before, just splurt out this conservative movement version of egalitarianism, which is that other races just need new values and they'll become Americans.